Call 6797981. And good morning from Adrian Kennedy. How are you this morning? It is Thursday, August 27th. And we're here until uh, midday today. We've a lot to get through on the programme. But first off, I like to start the show from time to time with lighter stuff. Well, this mightn't be that light. Uh, There's a great article in uh, the Herald today, and it is uh, entitled Fear and Loathing, The Stars Reveal Their Phobias. Um, And it's basically um, a load of celebrities and uh, the different things that they fear. So, for example... Um, Kendall Jenner and actually she has this in common with one of our uh, colleagues here in the office believe it or not is um, a trypophobia a trypophobic and that is somebody who um, fears tiny little holes in weird patterns um, like honeycombs um, and stuff like that sponges and things with holes Kendall Jenner is afraid of Khloe Kardashian is afraid of <laughs> Belly buttons. Liam Payne, this is a bizarre one. Uh, Liam Payne, the uh, former One Direction uh, member, is afraid of spoons. He says, when I was naughty as a kid, um, I would be made to do uh, the washing up. I had to wash all these nasty spoons and then it's just stuck with me after. I don't know, I don't know what people are doing with their spoons. I don't want to know. He's afraid of spoons basically, is Liam Payne. Kylie Minogue is afraid of um, hangers, you know, for hanging up your clothes. Uh, Johnny Depp is afraid of clowns. And the list goes on and on and on. In fact, I was talking to somebody uh, recently uh, who is afraid of car washes. Now, this is a grown adult. And what he does is he... Obviously, you you need to get the... um, the car cleaned so he will drive up to a car wash ideally he goes to a car wash that is a serviced car wash so there's people actually cleaning your car uh, and he gets out of the car and leaves them at it and if it's a um, you know a car wash with the brushes he uh, hops in types in the code parks the car and before the brushes start he legs it he just hates car washes I want to find out what is your phobia Send me a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 989898. 0877 I want to find out what are your phobias. What is that? And the weirder the one, uh, the more w- weird the better, basically. What is that one thing that you are afraid of? Like Kylie Minogue. Kylie Minogue. I, 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 I'm shocked. Poor old Kylie. Um, oh, where's Kylie's thing? Oh no, sorry, Jennifer Aniston is who we wanted to mention. Uh, Jennifer Aniston is afraid of flying. She's terrified of flying. Hates flying. Has to do it from time to time, but absolutely hates it. So I want you to send me a WhatsApp voice note right now to 87 Seven ninety-eight, 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 and let me know what is that one thing that you have a fear of. Um, and the weirder, the better, to be honest with you. Pamela Anderson has a fear of herself. Believe it or not. <laughs> and what she means by that is she can't watch anything uh, on television or in a movie that she's in. She just can't even look in a mirror unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, Rita Ora. <laughs> this is bizarre. Because you come in contact with this every day of your life. Uh, Rita Ora has a thing about toilets. She's afraid of toilets. Now, she has to use them, but she's terrified that something might uh, crawl up the toilet. (laughs) We did actually have a photograph last year of a rat crawling up a toilet here in Dublin. Uh, But anyway, that's what Rita Ora is afraid of. Send me a WhatsApp voice note right now to 087... 7 98 98 98 with your weird and wonderful phobias the weirder the better what is that one thing that makes you go <laughs> this is Stephen uh, hey Adrian um, porcelain dolls terrified of them they look like real people trapped in dolls bodies very scary <laughs> Now, I, I can kind of get that. I, I'm not afraid of them, but they, they some of them, porcelain dolls, that is, look ridiculously real. 
don't they? If they're really well made, they look ridiculously real. Uh, that's what uh, Stephen is afraid of. Uh, here's another WhatsApp voice note sent to 0877 98 98 98 from Gemma. Exactly same fear as Kendall Jenner. And for years, I, I didn't have a clue what was wrong with me regarding like little holes in places, sponges, honeycombs. It freaks me out. It makes me feel sick. It's just horrible. Now, to my name, uh, nameless colleague, who I know is listening right now, you're not alone. <laughs> Loads of people are afraid of honeycombs and things with holes in them. I never knew it was actually a thing until I read today that it is actually a thing, and it is called um, tripophobia. Tripophobia. You're afraid of holes and things like honeycombs and sponges and everything else. Kira, good morning. Morning, how are you? Kira, what is that thing you're afraid of? I cannot for the life of me go down escalators. Really? Yeah, I, I, I just cannot do it. I can go up the stair ones, all right, but I cannot go down. Oh. And if, I, if I'm in a shopping centre and there's an escalator to go up, I have to make sure there's a lift or stairs to come down. I just cannot go down. So going up is no bother? Going up is no problem. I think it's, do you know when you initially step on it and then there's suddenly a big drop. Yeah, it goes over a hill, like. Yeah, but it, it, it's quite sharp. I, th- I think it's just a fear of falling. I don't think I'm a fear of escalating. It's just a fear of falling. But no, I can't. I can't go down those at all. So, if, okay, so if you're going in, like, say, for example, I was in, where was I yesterday? Oh, in Marks and Spencer on Grafton Street, yeah? And yeah. Uh, I said, where's the men's section? And uh, the guy pointed over there and uh, up two flights. So I went up the escalator and up the escalator and away I went. Um, uh-huh. And you're telling me you could do that bit, but uh-huh. you'd need yep. to know in advance. You'd be asking him, is there stairs coming back down? Yeah, a stair or a lift come back down. And if there's not, I'm in trouble. Oh, and have you ever yeah, found I- yourself in a situation where you're, like, trapped? Yeah, yeah, once or twice. But there's um, no other and, way out except the down yeah. escalator. And I'm absolutely petrified. Petr- I'd be like uh, the, the kid at the dentist. He's have to force me onto it. Oh, my God, that is awful. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite, quite bad at them. Right, so you can go up the escalator, but I don't... I can go up because I can't really fall off going up. But you could going sense. over that hill coming down. But, I feel like I could fall going down. It just freaks me out completely. I cannot go down. That's mad. I, I wonder. There must be a there must be a word for that phobia. Um, but going down the escalator, uh, uh-uh, uh, no way. No, it's a big no, no. Big All right, here. No, no. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> what, what is your phobia? What is that one thing? Just like Kira, she can't go down an escalator. She can go up one. All right, no bother. But coming down, forget it. This is Megan. Hi, Adrian. Um, my phobia is of birds, <laughs> any type of birds, and that's been ever since I went to Australia. I was having a lovely meal out on a pier, and a massive seagull came down, took my food straight out of my hand, and proceeded to land about two or three feet away from me and eat the entire thing in front of me. Ooh. So ever since then, I have been petrified. Oh, right. OK, Megan, thanks very much. 67979081 is our telephone number, or send me a WhatsApp voice note to 087... 087- Seven ninety eight ninety eight ninety eight zero eight seven seven ninety eight ninety eight ninety eight. 9898 Where am I going now? Rachel, tell us about your phobia. Hi, um, it's just mushrooms. They just freak me out. <laughs> mushrooms? Mushrooms, yeah. <laughs> what is it, the look of them or...? It's, they're just fungus, like, it's just... I just don't see the point of mushrooms. They just panic me, like... They oh, they're gorgeous. Out. They're gorgeous. Oh, no, I can't oh. feel... In, in oh, garlic, oh, mushrooms and oh, garlic. No, oh, no, I can't. I couldn't. I couldn't, even if they're on me dinner now. Oh, jeez, I, I won't get to eat me dinner. And what about in, in batter? Would you like them in batter, no? No, 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 oh, no, no, God, no. no. Oh. They just freak me out. They just, they're just fungus. It's now, like, I know they are a fungus, and, you know, when you think about it, it's like, what a disgusting thing to eat. But they're little brown little balls. Like, I they're know, horrible. but once you get stuck into them, whoa, No, Adrian, no, that's just all no. wrong on all levels. <laughs> right, OK, so <laughs> mushrooms and you, a big no-no. A big no-no. And could, no, could you sit... Death divorce. Could you sit at a table with somebody else eating mushrooms? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm getting a, a little bit better, but... But yeah, no, it's just it's no, I can't. Yeah, I'd be able to sit with someone, but 
<laughs> be, yeah, I, even talking about it just gets me panicky. It's just, oh. Right, now, I, I was cutting our grass the other day, and there's a little patch in our grass uh, where there's mushrooms growing. I don't know how, where. <laughs> don't ask me where they're after coming from. Now, they're not the mushrooms you'd put on your plate, but yeah. that would completely freak you out. Yeah, yeah, it kind of freaked me out, yeah, definitely, yeah. They just, they're just, it's just, no, it's a no-go. All right, well, <laughs> you, won't be, <laughs> you won't be ordering garlic mushrooms anytime soon. Definitely not. <laughs> Good to talk to you, Rachel. Thanks very much indeed. Six seven nine seven ninety eight one is our telephone number. We all have a, a, a different type of phobia. What is yours? Is it escalators? Is it mushrooms? Teresa, what is that one thing that you're just uh, freaked out by? Good morning, Adrian. Good morning, Thunder Teresa. Thunder and lightning. Wouldn't be a fan myself now, I have to say. Um, wouldn't be well, a big fan, but I can cope with it. Oh, no. Oh, no, Adrian. Absolutely not. And I got the fear, I think, from my mum. Oh, why? Was she afraid of it as well? Oh, will you stop? My dad would be going to work. She'd be pouring bottles of holy water over. <laughs> right, so it passed on to you. So if there's... A, we haven't had much thunder and lightning of late. We did a bit a couple of weeks ago, but um, what do you do? Like, want to get under your bed? Into the wardrobe. Into the wardrobe? Yeah. So if you start hearing thunder and lightning straight into the wardrobe with you, yes. so you can't hear it and you can't see it. No, I have my, have my, my hands over my ears. Oh, my God. Because I, re- I remember a couple of years ago, uh, myself and herself were in, where were we? Oh, in New Orleans of all places, yeah. And it started lashing out of the heavens. So we said, right, nothing else to do. Uh, we'll go to a shopping centre. So we had a car and we were driving to this mall, as they call them over there, and we were stuck in traffic. And the next thing, uh, this clap of um, thunder above our heads was like a bomb went off. It was the loudest thunder I ever, ever, ever heard in my life. And I'll be honest with you, it gave me the fright of my life. But I wouldn't be afraid of it as such. But I, I know a load of people are. So thunder and lightning puts Teresa in the wardrobe. It does, along with balloons. Oh, balloons? Yes. And what's the issue with balloons? Oh, even the the look of them, the thought of them, the feel of them. Oh, so it's not the f- fear of them blowing up or anything, is it not? No, it's, it's just everything about them. Oh, right. Balloons. Yeah. So if, you, so if there was a birthday party birthday for you... Birthday party, stop. I have seven grandchildren, Adrian. Or, sorry, I have eight. Beg your pardon. Oh, yep. Um, and when they were younger, the balloons were up and I'd be ducking and diving, I would ruin. But, and most of all, New Year's Eve, when we used to, when I went out, when we went to um, a New Year's Eve party, and I looked up and there was this massive big net of balloons <laughs> oh, to no. let them down for New Year's Eve, straight to the toilet before <laughs> they came down. <laughs> That's mad! <laughs> So, if somebody was preparing a surprise birthday party for I, you, would they know not to have any balloons? Yes. Oh, yes. they would, right. Everybody yes. knows this. Yes. <laughs> Good to talk to you, Teresa. Thank you. Will. Morning, Adrian. My phobia is balloons, believe it or oh, not. Oh, as well. I hate going to kids' parties. Anything that goes on around the house or, you know, you're going to communions or christens or anything like that, and there's always balloons. And I'm constantly taking them off the kids, saying, oh, yeah, I'll hold that for you for later. And then I'll sneakily just put a little hole in it and let it down. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you hate the things. Just hate the bang off them. Okay, well, you're not alone because uh, Deborah's the same. One word for you, Adrian. Balloons. Hell no. (laughs) I absolutely hate them. I'm terrified of them. I'm terrified of them. I won't even be in the same room as them. Kids' parties, they freak me out. And God love a kid who asks me to help them blow a balloon up or tie a knot in it. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to (laughs) happen. Isn't that the maddest thing ever? Whoever thought people were afraid of balloons? Right, there you go. There's loads coming in. Keep them coming in to uh, a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 98 98 98. Uh, Philly's girlfriend has a fear. Hey, Adrian. Uh, my girlfriend has a fear of uh, losing her teeth and um, biting into things, teeth coming loose, anything at all, and might break or damage her teeth. Oh, my God. Uh, Obi, you're on 98 FM. How are you? Uh, not too bad. Good morning. Now, tell us about your fear. Oh my God, my fear is going on a boat or a ship. So anything that moves in the water, in the big water, like say deep water, I'm terrified. Oh. And 
So yeah, like surprisingly, if I go into a pool, I, I'm six foot three tall. So I when I exit six foot, I, I run back. So um, I went to actually in Del Medina. That was like three years ago, mm-hmm. and I tried, and they got me on a boat trip. You know, just Del Medina. I swear to God, Adrian, I thought I was gonna lose it. I oh thought I was gonna God. go mad. Yeah, like you know, and then I came back and never ever like. Um, I see people go on the jet skis and the, the boats and then cruise. Not for me. Like, okay, you know. so so not that they're sailing at the moment, but if I were to offer you a free holiday of a one-week Mediterranean cruise, you'd have to decline it, would you? Definitely. I'd rather go to Kerry. Oh. I just go. Or I, I go to, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather go to Galway, I swear to God, to Sotil, or just walk around town. I swear, I wouldn't know. Okay, so you it. are you able to fly then? Uh, I used to be terrified, but I'm okay now. Like, and I'm grand. I'm not the best flyer now, to be honest with you. But I'd rather go on a plane. Than, a, than, in a, than in a boat? Yeah. I've got 20 hours in Australia, just, you know, so cross you would, my fingers you, and go on a boat. You wouldn't go in a, in a pedal, you know, a pedal boat out in a lake or whatever, no? Not a chance? Well, no, not really. Like, you know, like, if it's a lake, I know, like, you know, something can go. I just don't know, like, you know, but if it's like a pool, yeah, because I know I'm in control to some extent, like, you know. But, like, I need deep water, like, you know, I'd like, no. Even with a life jacket, no tank, I just wouldn't. All right, so boats, a big no-no. All right, thanks very much indeed. Jessica? Morning, Adrian. I'm terrified of crows ever since I watched that film, the old black and white one. The boards, I think it was called with my granda all them years ago. They just freak me out. Okay, listen, we're going to take a quick break and we'll take a couple more after the break because we've been swamped with people's phobias. The weirder, the better. Call me on 67979891 or send me a WhatsApp voice note to 0877989898. Daily COVID-19 discussion and information. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. Loads of mad fears coming in, like uh, one of our listeners who uh, texted in a moment ago to say, I have a fear of velvet or corduroy fabric. I can't look at it, I can't touch it, I can't sit on it, I can't have anything to do with it. And another one from Ashling. runny eggs freak me out, I can't look at them, I feel sick at the thought of them. Ashling, what's wrong with you? I have a fear of hard eggs. They have to be runny, or they're just, they're not eggs. Bernie, you're on 98 FM. Hiya, Bernie. Good morning, how are you? Bernie, what is your fear, or fears, actually? Um, I'm probably going to be the most hated person in Dublin. I put a uh, overbite. Overbites? Overbites, yeah. So they, this is um, somebody whose top teeth over... Stick out, yeah. Um, I know it's horrible and all, but it's just, I don't know what it is. So if somebody has an overbite, you can't you can't really look at them, can you not? Yeah, I have to just close my eyes, or like if they catch me off guard because I work in public buildings. Right. They, if they tap me on the back or something and I turn around, I nearly get sick. You know, it's horrible. I know, really? I know. I just go, oh, and I just go, um, and I have to just like look like a freak. Oh my god, that is weird. And and the other one is, uh, it's a common one, but uh, wasps. But the thing is, I've nearly, like, killed my mother with, like, driving a wasp in the car to... I was in a restaurant, and a wasp started flying around me, and, and I started flinging chairs. I nearly killed a baby. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, no, I wouldn't be a fan of wasps now, but I wouldn't be yeah. afraid of them as such. Oh, um, I get psychotic. I just no control in me. I just, I just freak out, and, and I leg it, and I scream, and I look mental. Well, I'd say you look you see even more. Small redhead running around the street. I'd say you're mad. even. You look even more mental now when you uh, nearly get sick over somebody with an overbite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like one of my colleagues, she was uh, she was standing with me and she knew my fear. And the person tapped me on the back and I turned around and there's a and she was like, "Oh Jesus!" Christ. <laughs> and she had to take over, and they were like looking and going, "What?" That and is I insane. Like, Heaved over, kind of. Right. Like, okay, uh, Bernie. I hate to tell you. I've got an overbite. And <laughs> you know what the worst thing is? I have a little one as well. Oh, right. But luckily, listening to the radio, you don't have to look at me. So that's the main thing. That's uh, good. So All right, I Bernie. Like you look like you're very pretty. Good to talk to you, Bernie. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed. Um, now, uh, Sarah, tell us about your phobia. Um, I'm terrified of airplanes. Like, I'm terrified of flying. But, like, even if one flies over my house, I literally freak out. Like, I can't stand it. I get so scared. And do you ever go on them? Yeah. So is it, no- like, is it a horrible ordeal? 
yeah, it's horrible. I hate it. Like, I'd prefer never to go on one, but, um, like, my husband goes mad. But I don't even sit beside any of my family on the plane. Like, I can't. They can't sit beside me because I get so scared. Freak out the whole time. So, you, so you, cho- you, you would sooner sit beside a randomer? Yeah, I, they, well, they don't want to sit beside me. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> And so if, if if I happen to be the randomer that you're sitting beside in the airplane, what will that experience be like for me? Uh, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> literally horrible. Oh, it's, it's intense. I've literally like jumped up on a plane before and said, the engines are off. Oh my like, God. I, <laughs> I can't handle it. But then I read a book um, about a fear of flying and it says like, always just tell the air hostesses when you get on. So usually they let me sit down the back with them. For the whole flight. Right. God, I, I couldn't put myself through that now if I had that sort of a fear. I love flying. I love airplanes. Oh my God. No, I hate it. I can't, like, I literally, even if they fly over my house, like, I've literally hopped out of bed and ran downstairs, like, freaking out. I can't stand it. That's unbelievable. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Sinead sent me this. I'm not going on the air, but I am absolutely witless of cotton wool. I can't touch it. I can't look at it. It just absolutely terrifies me. <laughs> I'm also allergic to cameras. To cameras? You're allergic to... Did you say cameras? Hang on, let me have a listen to that again. I'm, I'm also allergic to cameras. She did say cameras, didn't she? Yeah. OK, Ryan, you're on 98FM. How are you, Ryan? Oh, good, Adrian. Ryan, what, what's your phobia? I am terrified of clowns. Well, you're not alone, it would appear, uh, because, who is it? Is it Johnny Depp? Uh, Yeah, Johnny Depp, you're in good company, is terrified of clowns. He said it's something uh, about the painted face, the fake smile. There always seems to be a darkness lurking just under the surface. Exactly, 100% terrified of them. I had to walk out of the circus with my two little sisters, um, my uh, other half, and she had to text me when the clown part was over. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't be going to a circus then because they tend to feature in circuses, don't they? I know. I was dragged along. It wasn't my idea, trust me. So Ronald McDonald now, you wouldn't be a fan of him? Can't do it. My sisters came in the other week trying the same. Ronald McDonald eats little kids and everything, and I just I walked out of the house. <laughs> Oh, right. Okay, Ryan. And finally, Katie, what is your fear? Hi, Adrian. Hi, yeah. Um, my fear is adults dressed as babies. Adults dressed as babies? Yeah, I don't have any explanation for it. I just... Sorry, how often do you see this phenomenon? Luckily, not often, right? But it's, it always seems to crop up around Halloween. You'll always get, you know, somebody in a bar dressed as a... A baby, you know, with the, the bib and the hat. and No, I just can't. Oh, my God. I just can't. Right, so if you went to a fancy dress party and somebody happens to be dressed like a baby in a big, huge nappy with a big, huge soother, you're gone, are you? Oh, yeah. No, like, I've moved away from a bar before because there was a man standing <laughs> in a full baby get-up and I, I just couldn't look at him. And <laughs> I don't know what it is. There's no explanation. <laughs> That is the weirdest fear ever. It really is. All right, Katie, thanks for sharing that with us. And one more phobia from this man who wishes to remain nameless. Morning, Adrian. My phobia is going home to her indoors after a few points on me when she doesn't even know he's in the pub. That's frightening. (laughs) Look. All right, thank you very much indeed. They were brilliant. Uh, some really good phobias. Uh, and good luck with the rest of your life living with all of those uh, phobias. This is 98FM. 98 98FM's 98 Dublin Talks. IMRO award-winning local current affairs show of the year. And this is Adrian Kennedy with you until midday today. Now, on to more serious matters, although there is nothing more serious than a phobia that you have to live with, is there? Anyway... I want to move on to uh, something different. I did mention earlier on in the week that I wanted to come back and talk about this, and I do today. I want to ask you a question. Is it fair or reasonable to ask young children uh, from 6 to 11 to wear a face mask in school? The World Health Organization has recently updated its recommendations uh, saying that children aged 6 to 11 should be wearing uh, face masks, particularly in uh, schools. 
the Irish National Teachers Organisation is seeking clarity on the public health guidance relating to uh, primary schools and special schools with young children as to whether or not uh, they should recommend or the government is going to recommend the wearing of face masks by young kids in school. And I want to find out how you feel about this. As we know, there's been a lot of talk in the last uh, few days, the last couple of weeks, about increased cases of COVID-19. We're hearing of uh, different outbreaks in different settings. We're hearing that uh, Dublin is in uh, particular in a bad way and that we, God forbid, could be looking at uh, another lo- national lockdown, God forbid. The thoughts of it. Well, uh, the Minister for Health... Um, yesterday addressed this whole thing. Stephen Donnelly was speaking to a uh, Doyle committee yesterday. Uh, You asked why the pubs were closed. Deputy, can can I say I share your frustration? Um, It's not fair. It is not fair for publicans around the country. Uh, I know that. The reality is we are dealing with a virus that is close to us having to lock down the country again. The public health advice is that we are at a tipping point and we are doing everything we can to suppress this virus, to stop a second lockdown, to get the schools open, which we now have, to keep the businesses open, to protect jobs, to get the hospitals open and so forth. Uh, And the public health advice and evidence is that in other countries, unfortunately, where the pubs have opened, they have been associated very quickly with outbreaks. uh, And that's the reason. I really don't want to be here saying that. Uh, I would like nothing more than to be announcing, and hopefully I will be as soon as possible, announcing they have to be reopened. Okay, so that was a fairly stark warning from the Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly, yesterday, that God forbid we, uh, if we can't get on top of this virus, uh, we could be looking at another national lockdown. Now, if... One of the ways of uh, controlling that is for young children to be wearing face masks in school in order to prevent them bringing uh, the virus home or bringing it into school and preventing uh, outbreaks. Some would say this is a great idea. Um, It will do no harm, maybe just for the next couple of months until we get on top of it. Um, Or... Maybe you think the damage we could be doing to children by <clears throat> making young children in particular, secondary kids are, are you know, they're a bit uh, older and whatever. Uh, but uh, I want to hear from you on 67979081. You can text, you can WhatsApp, you can send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877989898. And in fact, only earlier today, uh, we uh, got an email from a lady called Wendy. And here's what Wendy wrote to me this morning. She says, um, I'm just wondering if you can bring this topic up. My daughter is starting first year tomorrow and will only know one other child from primary school. Up till yesterday, the students had to wear face masks in corridors and outdoor areas. Now, this is secondary school, by the way, and maybe practical classes, which is fine. But yesterday, an email was sent out to parents to say that students will be wearing face masks all through the day. Uh, I am not happy. As it is, she's nervous about going back. Her whole year has been disrupted, missing out on her last uh, few months in primary school. This is all about making friends. This is after knocking her. She's so upset. She's 12 years of age and by law isn't asked to wear one. And uh, Wendy asked us to talk about it. Now, that's for uh, secondary school. And we know that there is much clearer guidance on secondary schools and kids having to wear uh, face masks in secondary school. But what about primary school? What about younger kids aged 6 to 11? Should... And like you just heard Stephen Donnelly there talk about how we are doing everything in our power to prevent a second national lockdown. Nobody wants that. So if we have to do everything within our power to prevent that happening, to prevent the virus spreading, like, for example, younger kids wearing face masks in school, maybe that's not too much to ask. Or... Maybe you think it is too much to ask, that it is too much to be asking kids aged 6 to 11 to put on a face mask when they go to school and leave it there for the rest of the day. 
Call me right now on 67971. You can also text WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 98 98 98. The Irish National Teachers Organisation is seeking clarity on the public health guidance after the World Health Organisation issued updated recommendation which says that children aged between 6 and 11 should wear face masks on a risk-based approach. Call me now, 67979881. Uh, the very first uh, message that's just come in to us, this is madness what is happening now in schools. Uh, we would not have this issue if we, if we had just allowed the virus to go through society. Mm. Don't know if anybody agrees with that. Uh, Anne, you're on 98FM. Hi, Anne. How are you going? Good, thank you, Anne. Now, you've uh, two children in that uh, age category, one five, yep. one eleven. Yep. And they are both wearing um, face masks to school. Yep. And Absolutely. are they keeping them on for the day? Yeah, no problem. The teacher actually offered the smallest fella yesterday, to, like, she just gave him the option. She said, you don't have to wear it in class if you don't want to. And he said, nope, he's keeping it on him. So So he's ha- he's happy enough to wear it? Yep. Not a bother on them because they know we have we have a very vulnerable family um, health wise. Like the, I have twins as well. They're sixteen. They're asthmatic. I have a ninety two year old gran who stares at me regularly. Mm-hmm. My mum has chronic asthma. My mother in law lives here. She is type uh, type two diabetic. So we've we've a vulnerable family. So from the very start, we were very open with the kids. We were saying, look, not everyone is going to do it, but we're going to do it. So and we kind of had them all over the summer getting used to them and. Even doing a little bit of running around the garden with it on for a little while every day just to mm. get them used to the fact of, of having it on and having if they had to do something that they were breathing a little bit heavier, they'd be used to it and stuff like that, you know. But they're they're in the class there and there's not a problem. The school is great. I was Yesterday I went over to drop them. It's a staggered drop-off. So I dropped over the first girl and the place was chock-a-block with parents. They were on top of each other. No face masks on any parent. Um, very little on the kids. Actually, probably a very, very small handful of parents had them, to be fair. Um, but they were all on top of each other and hugging each other and how's it going? Haven't seen you in ages. Which is, which is fair enough. I understand. That's our mm. nature. But it frightened the life out of me. I was about to turn back with her. I really got a big fright. I said, Jesus, nobody's actually taking this seriously. So I, I said, no, I'll just see how it goes. I dropped her off. I came over with the small lad and I dropped him off. Now, this morning it was completely different. There was... Um, so where yesterday you might have had two parents dropping kids off because of the first day, now today you only had the one parent and most people had face masks on and a lot more children had the face masks on. Right. Um, so uh, I, your five-year-old yeah, um, yeah. is wearing a face mask all day in school? Yeah, no problem to him. He whips it off then when we walk out of the schoolyard. Once we're clear of, the, of any other people, he'll, he'll whip it off then. But they, they wear them into the shops. The only, t- the only way I'll allow my kids into a shop with me is if they put a face mask on. So they're used to them. You know, and it's safe. It is safe. I know I can understand a lot of people's anxiety and worries about it. And I can see where they're coming from. But I'd rather have them have it, even if it was a bit, a little bit of discomfort, which it isn't. Even if is it, it was. Is I'd it not? Be, is it no, not, Anne? I, well, no. I, I wore one for a half an I hour yesterday them. walking yeah, around uh, the shops. And I ripped it off my face when I came out of the <laughs> shop. I couldn't wait to get the thing off. I felt... I know. It felt claustrophobic. I felt... Yeah. All, uh, I was hot. I was flushed. It was horrible. Yeah, now, yeah I do agree with you. It does... And, I, and I'm, I do feel the very same myself. But the longer you have it on and the more you kind of control yourself, it does feel... It, it does... It, you get used to it. It's kind of the... Like but, a, but a five-year-old? Like a norm. He's fine. I Honest to God, he's actually fine. If he wasn't, I'd have to rethink. And I actually... I'm one of those parents that was actually thinking, I don't want to send my kids back. I'm, re- I'm actually really afraid of this virus. I'm, t- I'm terrified of it because I have so many people that it could affect. But I was going to actually contact Tusla and ask them, could I homeschool my kids? That's how worried I was. But n- now that the kids are OK wearing the masks in and they're comfortable enough and there's, there's no hassle with them. When the teacher offered him to take the mask off yesterday... So was he, he, was he the only one wearing one? No, no. There was two or three other kids in his class and a lot more now today than there was yesterday wearing them. The same in my daughter's yeah, but it's, it's one thing wearing them in the door, but uh, wearing them in class for the whole day. Yeah, he's fine. He's actually fine. And there's a couple more kids doing the same thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot more you, this morning than there was yesterday. OK, do you think that the government should recommend that primary school kids from six up should wear face masks for the whole day? Uh, no, I don't. 
I, I would prefer it personally. If it, like, I would like the guy sitting across from my son to have one on as well because my son is protecting him, so he should protect my son. But at the end of the day, they are kids, and kids will react differently to it. Okay, uh, you mentioned, and uh, somebody just texted thing. in to ask me to ask you this. A question for that yeah. woman, the five-year-old with a mask. Has her child worn it before for six hours uh, at a stretch? No, not six hours, no. But we have gotten them kind of used to having it on their face. But yesterday, he didn't take it off at all, and he was fine. And when he was and did he say he was fine? Morning, he said he didn't yes, bother him? not a bother. And then when he... Because I ask him everything. I need to know these things from him, because I don't want him being uncomfortable either, you know? So when he... When he was coming home yesterday, he just popped it off on the way home. And then when we were leaving this morning, I nearly forgot it. And he said, me mask. And he ran back in and grabbed his mask. And oh, right, back. okay. So he's well used to it. Yeah, Do yeah, me a favour, Anne. Stay on the line there for one second. Because, Katrina, I'm going to talk to you straight after the break. Um, yeah. You're basically saying that you will not be putting masks on, uh, on your young kids. No, I no. definitely won't. No. Okay, stay there for one second. I'll be with you straight after the break. Up to date coronavirus discussion for Dublin. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. Teachers have called for an urgent review of rules which exempt primary school children from wearing face masks in light of new international health guidance aimed at curbing the spread of COVID-19. The World Health Organization, as we've been hearing, has issued updated recommendations which say children aged between 6 and 11 should wear face masks Um a number of factors to be taken into account including the intensity of transmission in the area and we know here in Dublin we're starting to develop a problem again Uh, the child's ability to use the mask access to masks and adequate adult supervision a lot of people are really against this idea this is Sinead morning everybody Sinead here there's not an absolute hope I would be sending any of my kids to school in a face mask. I have a child just gone into sixth class who's 11, and then I have a child just gone into first class who is six. Do you guys not think our kids have been mentally damaged enough by this, let alone to put on a face mask on a six-year-old going into school? Oh, my God, that is absolutely so wrong. And I just think, how come all of a sudden these kids have to wear face masks. Why all of a sudden do they have to wear them? All of, like this virus has been here for what, six months now? And towards the end, oh yeah, let's put face masks on our kids. Do you know what it is? Because they're trying to find out where they're going wrong. Where they're going wrong is who's sitting behind them doors in that bloody well doll. That's who it is. That government is an absolute sham. How long are they in? It's six, seven weeks. And how many people have they lost already? Four or five? One rule for them, one rule for us. Not a hope will I be sending my kids to school with a face mask on. It makes me so angry. Thank you, Sinead. Have a great day, guys. Bye. Thank you, Sinead. Have a great day. Katrina, you also yeah. won't be uh, putting a face mask on your children. What ages are they? Um, well, I have five children, but the two that I'm in small school would be 12 and 8, and I will never put a mask on them. And what I find... Now, sorry, the 12-year-old's still in primary school? He's still in primary school, yeah, this year. Okay, so at at this moment, uh, the face mask wearing doesn't apply to primary school kids. It applies to secondary school kids. So let's deal with primary. Um, The uh, INTO has asked for clarity on whether or not 6 to 11-year-olds should be wearing them. What will you do if that is brought in, if it is made a recommendation that kids wear face masks all day in school? Well, the first thing is the World Health Organization came out months ago and said the masks were not working. A, a professor from Oxford University has said 10% masks might work, may work 10% in a controlled environment. And if you look, children are a strong immune system. And what they're trying to do is weaken the immune system of these children. I, I was at the protest last Saturday in Dublin and Dr. Marcus De Brun, he is a GP, a general practitioner, him plus 1,700 doctors in the US of A have spoke out against mask wearing, saying they do not work. We've been told worldwide by different organisations up till now that they do not work, they don't do anything. Look, a virus is not going to... But they don't, you, you could argue, uh, Katrina, they don't do any harm either, do they? They do. They suffocate you. I mean, for anyone suffering with anxiety, asthma, breathing problems, you name it, there's many hidden illnesses. Masks 
are an absolute joke. We were told not to wear them. How all of a sudden there's so much more to this than it's about. Okay, virus. one of, one of the reasons at the very there's start of this pandemic that we were reality. we were told wasn't necessary was because there was a fear that there would be just like with toilet roll a run on face masks yeah. and the health service wouldn't be able to get their hands on it. Now we don't have a shortage because every Tom, Dick and Harry is making them now. So we don't have a shortage of them. So they they can now recommend them. Well, uh, I know for one thing that my kids... And what about the elderly people that basically were murdered in homes? They're distracting us from the real truth by focusing us on these masks. Why are the government not doing an investigation? Michal Martin said clearly, we'll not do an investigation into the murders of the elderly people in these homes who are left to die. Okay, then, and, uh, 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 look, I, on, on the, with regard to... Okay, hang on for one second, hang on. With, with, with regard to the um, nursing homes, I think, yes, I totally agree with you, there needs to be a full uh, investigation into that. However, what I'm concerned about, and what the government are concerned about, is the fact that we um, can't get away from the fact that we now had like 164 cases yesterday, 93 of which were right here in Dublin. Yeah. Now, yeah. that yeah. is a big worry. So, rather they're than... they're doing more testing. They're doing more testing. I understand that. I know they are. I know they are. But would you not rather, if you had a choice then, between right. kids wearing face masks of age 6 to 11... Or another national lockdown because we can't get on top of this thing. Well, let me tell you, there's going to be a lockdown the end of October. I've been informed by someone I know in government. Hang on, hang on. Did, nobody can predict that, Katrina. I can, so. gu- I can guarantee you, as soon as the flu season hits, they're going to shut down the schools straight away. And I've been told that. And not only that, Adrian, my daughter's boyfriend's father is a lab technician. He checks viruses. When you go to a hospital and you get your blood test for a virus, that's him that does it. And he says... Corona is a common cold, along with SARS virus of the chest. That's how they diagnose, they diagnose COVID. This is an absolute scam. We've been put into fear to submit to a okay, government... So, uh, uh, fine, uh, fine, we had this conversation the other day about the protest on Saturday and all of that. But let me ask you specifically, with kids and face masks, if your child's school, your children's school, was to tell you next Monday uh, yeah. you are going to have to uh, send them to school, they have to wear face masks all day, what are you going to do? Take them out immediately and homeschool them. Simple as that. And I know many that will do. I know, well, that. Well, well, I'm getting that feeling myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, that you, okay. So you will take your kids out of school if you are told they have to wear face masks. The minute, the minute they told, the minute they're told. All right, stay there for a second, Katrina. Six seven nine seven ninety eight one is our telephone number. You can text, you can WhatsApp, or you can send a WhatsApp voice note to oh eight seven seven ninety eight ninety eight ninety eight oh eight seven seven ninety eight ninety eight ninety eight. 0877 98 98 98. Stephen, you're on 98 FM. Hi, Stephen. How's it going? Good, thanks, Stephen. We've heard one woman whose five-year-old wore a face mask all day yesterday in school. We've heard from another woman saying, I will whip my kids out of school straight away if they're told they have to wear face masks. What's your opinion on this? You're, you're well, a school bus driver, is that right? Yeah, I'm a local school bus driver. I work for uh, Bus Aaron. And um, uh, just my biggest issue was I have a range between five-year-olds to 10-year-olds to okay. 13-year-olds, and not one of them are wearing masks. Um, and uh, do you I think they bit, should be? Well, I, I, can't, I can't tell a five-year-old to wear a mask. I, it's it just it's just wrong. But a ten year old, you imagine they have a bit of cop on, they would wear a mask. Like I, I approached one of the kids today for a mask, and the mother went through me and she said to me, "How dare you um, attack?" Or I didn't attack, but I just told him to wear a mask, and she lost the plot with me and basically humiliated me in front of all the rest of the kids. So I had to let him on the bus. So I've tour- I've forty five kids on my bus, and none of them were wearing masks. And when I approached the school, um, all the parents that were bringing their kids by cars, not one of them had a mask on. Just the teachers were uh, welcoming them back into the school. They had masks on. And I had a mask on, and that was it. Like. Okay, now, uh, do you think that primary school children should be firstly wearing, and we're talking about primary kids, I, mean, I think yeah. we all accept secondary kids are a bit different because they're grown up, they're, uh, they're yeah. growing up, they're older. Young kids wearing face masks, do you think they should be? On a bus, yes. And in a school, I, I'm, pleased, I'm sure it's the same thing, yeah. But I, for a school, 
in a bus in a small closed up area for 45, 50 minutes I, I, I can't see any reason why why not you can't see any reason why not yeah I don't think it's a big deal Okay, stay there for a second. Um, uh, Anne, oh, sorry, uh, Martin is who I want to go to. Martin, you're on 98 FM. How are you? Hello, hello, guys. How okay, there's uh, the a bus driver, a school bus driver, saying kids should at least be wearing face masks on the school bus. What's your opinion on this? Uh, I can't, I can't agree with that. Unfortunately, uh, the reason is that children are totally safe from the virus. That's the main thing, and everyone, every doctor will tell you that. You know, so so uh, really, uh, uh, have, being totally safe is one thing, but they can contract it. We have had um, no, uh, they can't. They, yes, they, they can. can. Sorry, the Ma- Ma- Martin. No, no, no. I have to correct you there. They can. They can contract it. They may not be sick from it, um, but they can <laughs> contract it. So that, that we have had several children, in fact, over a hundred children, in my understanding, over the last couple of weeks, who have uh, contracted COVID nineteen and diagnosed positive for it. So they can exactly. get it. So the main, the main thing. This is what what, what I want to point to everyone. Uh, every day we can see the headlines. We have one hundred new cases, one hundred fifty, fifty. Okay. The main thing. Nobody actually reporting how many tests is done, okay? Mm-hmm. Because we are making more and more tests, sometimes 13,000 per day, and we have 100 uh, positive tests. So that, that's the main thing, that the uh, PCR tests are not, it's not a tool to tell you are you sick or not. I have a, a main specification open on front of me on the computer. I, I can read this for you now. This product is indeed for the detection of 2019 novel coronavirus, so 2019 and co. The detection result of this product is only for clinical reference, and it should not be used as the only evidence for clinical diagnosis and treatment. So the point here is, every day we can see we have 100 positive uh, results. The result can be positive because you had a cold 10 years ago, because you have chlamydia. You can read this on every Okay, website. yeah, well, uh, 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 Martin, so I'm, not, I'm not just going to take point, your word. Is, is, if, you, if you would send me on that article, uh, Martin, I'd appreciate it. I have to be very careful doing a radio show like this that we don't disseminate uh, false or misleading information. So uh, send that on to me. I'll have a read of it and uh, then we can discuss it a bit more. I have to take a quick break. We're back in a sec. Don't go away. 90. It's 11 o'clock across Dublin. Good morning. This is Adrian Kennedy. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks. And this is Emma with Thursday's Top Headlines. Thanks, Adrian. Good morning. Concerns been raised about COVID-19 cases at a Dublin care home after a staff member allegedly hit a positive test result from management. An elderly resident and another worker were found to have the virus after testing was carried out, according to the Irish Independent, while other staff members are self-isolating. The President of the European Commission says EU commissioners have to comply with COVID-19 rules. Ursula von der Leyen has been speaking after the resignation of Phil Hogan over the Gulf Gate controversy. A status yellow rain warning is in place for Leinster and Munster. It runs until the early hours of tomorrow morning with potentially heavy thundery downpours. Anon Post has released a book of stamps marking 25 years of legendary sitcom Father Ted. They include some of the show's most famous one-liners, including That's Mad Ted, Will You Have a Cup of Tea, Father, and The Money Was Just Resting in My Account. And now you're up to date on 98. Down with that sort of thing is the best line. Exactly. (laughs) Thank you, Emma. (laughs) 98 FM Dublin Talks Call 6797981 And good morning from Adrian Kennedy Uh, We're in the middle of a conversation about something that people feel very strongly about and that is young children being forced to wear face masks for the entire day at school Um, The World Health Organization recently updated recommendations which say children aged 6 to 11 should wear face masks in school A lot of parents are saying, I will not be sending my kids back to school if they have to wear a face mask. And they're being very, very blunt about it. And an awful lot of people feel the same way. Mark sent me this WhatsApp voice note to 0877 98 98 98. Hi Adrian, great show there. Mark here, Uncle Kenny. No, uh, regarding the masks, I wouldn't be letting kids under that age to wear wear face masks. They're scared enough going to school this morning and I see a lot of parents with visors and masks. The kids look t- terrified in the schoolyard this morning. Um, and these parents saying that they should be wearing it well. 
Jesus Christ, like, uh, they're trying to get a bit of normality for our kids, not not um, having wear masks um, for the whole school day, like, um, no, definitely not. Um, great show, guys. Cheers. And Stephen sent me this message. Come on, Adrian, if they're not moaning about uniforms, now they've something to moan about masks, just put on masks, send the kids to school with some hand sanitizer. let them get their education, let's get it done, please. Mm. Uh, Jer, you're on 98FM. Hi, Jer. Hey, how's it going? Now, Jer, you uh, don't see what the issue is here because kids are very good at adapting. Yeah, I, I mean, that lady at the start, she got her kids used to wearing masks and there's no problem with it. The only reason why kids are going to make a big issue of it are going to be scared is because of parents. Parents are going to make it a big deal. The kids are going to look at the parents and go, oh, wait, this is a big deal. And then it's going to be an issue. If you teach the kids early on to wear masks, they're going to adapt very quickly. Children are very... I know, but a, lo- a lot of people are saying that this just... this is, OK, it's not normal for any of us, but it's mm. particularly abnormal for young children to be covering their faces. You know, I completely understand that, but like, as everyone is saying, this is going to be the norm for a while. We don't know how long we're going to have this. So are we going to risk society by allowing children... Yet yeah, they don't, um, obviously, suffer from the virus as much, but they do carry it and they can pass it on. Mm. I mean, a lot of people are saying, like, the kids are grand, they won't get sick, and we all know that. But a lot of those people are forgetting the fact that it's the elderly people. And no, people and, and, and in big. fact, um, only a, a few minutes ago during the ad break, I was uh, reading that in France they have, um, the French government has said that it has to move very fast to prevent a, a deadly wave of COVID-19. And what they're recommending is that grandparents, as of today no longer collect their grandchildren from school. They're basically telling grandparents to stay away from the kids. I know, and it's, it's terrible. And all people are being asked to do is to get the children used to wearing masks. I mean, it's not that hard. Kids, get they adapt quickly. And as I said, they're only going to be a problem if the parents make it a problem. The kids learn from their parents. So if they see their parents going absolutely berserk and crazy and reacting negatively towards the mask, the kids are going to react negatively. But that lady at the start who got her kids progressively used to wearing them, there's no problem. Okay, but and you've I mean, also heard other parents saying, I will take my children out of school okay. if they have to wear face masks. And, like, that's their choice. I now, know I know the terrible. other alternative is even worse. The other alternative yeah. of shutting the schools back down again because we go into another national lockdown is, is worse, yeah, I suppose, is. is it? And that's what people are going to have to weigh up. If you don't want to send your kids to school with a mask or a visor or whatever it is because that's your belief and you think that's going to be traumatising to students, that's your choice. If you don't want them to go to school, don't go to school. You hold school them, you do what you need to do to make yourself and your family feel safe. But by being selfish about it, you risk doing exactly what you said, putting the country back into a national lockdown where no one can go to school. And those who choose to go to school with masks, they have that choice taken away from them mm. because of people who are just saying, no, 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 I'm not doing it. Where, where's the proof? That okay, so, so you're, you're saying get your head around this, basically. Um, yeah. Kids will adapt and this is better than an, an, another national lockdown. Absolutely, because I don't think the country could afford to go no, into I don't, I don't think lockdown. it could either. I'm, and I'm, people who are saying that the government is doing this, they're trying to weaken our immune systems, take the tinfoil hats off. That's just silly. Why would the government be purposely doing that. Do you get me? I don't believe they would, but anyway, exactly. uh, unfortunately, I mean, lot, unfortunately, unfortunately, there are some people. who do. Yeah, yeah, and that's feeding down into the kids, and that's feeding out into society, and it's just mind-boggling how silly people are about this. Wear a mask. China, the people over there have been wearing masks for years because of the smog they have over there and because of their pollution. It's not an issue over there because they got used to it as a society. Okay, so uh, stay there for one second if you can, please, Chair. Yeah. Uh, Bernadette, you're on 98 FM. Hi, Bernadette. Hi. Uh, Bernadette, we yeah. need to get our heads around this. We need to just allow kids to wear face masks. They'll easily adapt to it. I don't believe so. I, I, I have uh, grandchildren going to school and also there's asthmatic asthma in our family. And the children, it's bad enough for them going back to the change is in, in the school without wearing them. And even so, if you do wear them, they're going to be pulling at the masks, trying to breathe, so the hamburger jams are going to be going all over the place. And I don't think they really understand. You know, at 9 to 11 or 12, they don't really understand. Now, secondary school, maybe, yes, but not for the younger children. 
Um, what about what about that point, Jerry? Because we've been told we adults have been told how to wear face masks and uh, you know not to be touching them, not to be pulling at them. Uh, it's very difficult, I have to say, uh, as an adult to not be touching it or uh, yeah. whatever. Uh, with kids, they are going to be touching it, and pulling at it, and rubbing their nose and all of that. Yeah, which kind of defeats the purpose. I understand, but like as I said, it's because they don't—they're not used to it. They're pulling at it and rubbing their yeah, nose. Okay, but I'm not used to it. You're probably not used to it. Um, yet, uh, and I still pull at it. And I found oh. myself yesterday rubbing <laughs> my nose, and yeah, it's—it's <laughs> it's not nice. Oh no, I, I no, it's not nice. They're not comfortable. They can be irritating for the wearing for long periods of time. I completely understand that. But we have to weigh the options up. Is it a case of? We just try and get used to it. When the kids go into school, we get the schools to teach the children about wearing masks and why we need to wear them and that we shouldn't stick at them. Or we just put, dig our heels in and say, no, 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 we're not wearing them. And then we go into another lockdown for another six months. That's a, that's a I mean, Bernadette, I'm sure you yeah. would agree, the thought, and even hearing it being mentioned uh, yesterday, the thought of another national lockdown just terrifies me, I it, have it to be is, honest. It terrifies everybody, but like uh, I, a lot of people really don't understand it, even at this stage. But the thing is, with children that are asthmatic, I'm asthmatic myself, and after, like I said, a half an hour, 20 minutes, I can't breathe, I have to take it out, and get out of where I am and take the mask off me, so how... Are children going to feel they have to sit in a classroom all day? Like, how in the name of God are they going to sit there? Like, they're going to take panic attacks and everything like with this. With this. I think that okay, but it, it, let, me read, let me read this uh, message that's just come in to me and it says, Do you know what's even more traumatising for children? Losing a family member prematurely because of this virus. Just put a mask on them, they'll be grand, they'll bounce back and get over it. I'm sick of listening to this, we're all in the same boat, adults and children. This is unprecedented and we're all just doing the best we can. If you can't uh, parent your child enough to explain this all to them, then homeschool them. Basically, she's saying, uh, suck it up and just get on with it and, and, and put face masks on the kids. That's easy enough for a lot of people to say, but like uh, for, for the children, I, don't, I, I think it's very, very unfair. Some ch- children, a lot of children will be will wear them, you know, but th- what about the children that can't? Like, seriously, you can't wear them and start panicking with them on them and if they're breathing, if they're asking, is that them or, you know, they, they can't breathe? Like, it's really not right. Yeah, I, I, don't I, understand, think it's right. I understand it's not right and it's going to cause uncomfortableness for yeah. students and for kids. And, like, and the fact that we're in this society... Effect. The fact that we're in the situation is horrible. But as was mentioned there, what happens if the country goes into a lockdown where the kids can't even go back outside to play? They can't even hang around with the, the kids in their estate. Yeah, kids will find them uncomfortable and they will probably get a bit anxious and have panic attacks. But that's then, again, that's, then that's the family like they're, unit. They're not uh, going through enough like that already. I know, it it's is, terrible. You know? I know, it's terrible. But yeah. should we not be trying to get the kids used to it at home? We tried, we tried already, like we've, we've been doing it in bits and pieces. But yeah, like I said, they're putting their up. hands up to their eyes, yeah. they're pulling at the mask, they're... So, the Bernadette, like, if you look at adults, and I remember, I was, okay, I well, but I, re- I remember having this conversation in April and May and June yeah. about wearing face masks on buses, and then it became shops, and then it became and always, always a one, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and uh, w- the point I was about to make is yesterday when I was in um, a supermarket, I was in yeah, a, a yeah, uh, clothes yeah. store. Everybody was wearing face masks. The yeah, point being I, that we, yeah. we've we've gotten our heads around it now. We've gotten yeah, used we to have. it. So yeah. we just have to pass that on to the kids, no? Well, uh, hopefully, please God, yes. But my concern mm. would be that, I don't know, it would be for the younger children, you know, how it's going well, to affect them. Then should we not have, like, the primary schools and the schools have a mechanism in place for students well, to who know, are having what panic child, attacks? If they, they should to understand be taken out for a few minutes. Sorry, I can't hear yeah. both of you there. Sorry, Jerry, say that again. I understand what um, that, that caller is saying about the panic attacks and anxiety mm. and stuff like that. Like it's, a, it's an issue in society, especially with young kids and teenagers. So that should be then down to the schools to maybe have a mechanism in place that if a child is panicking or feeling uncomfortable, that there's an area, like the schools now are supposed to have the COVID isolation area, that they can go into to compose themselves for a few minutes, take the mask off in a safe environment, they can get themselves well, hope, calm hope and then go back like into class. 
Like that's and, the thing. That's, there is ways of resolving the issue, but the yeah. way people are reacting with just digging the heels in and saying no, 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 no. I'm just going to pull. You my see, I, I, I just think, Chair, uh, people. I haven't heard much objection to secondary school students wearing masks. I really haven't. Mm. And if there is, well, one the email I read earlier on, but. Uh, we're talking about like little kids, little yeah. small kids, before they've even yeah. made their first Holy Communion. Mm-hmm. And I, I understand they're really young kids and they're going to be pulling at their faces and they, they don't understand it. But as I said, kids learn from their parents about things. Like, yes, yeah, they're watching kids that that generally have a, everything yeah, else. But a child has a fear of dogs. They've learned that fear from a parent. If someone has a layer of fear of spiders, generally just someone in the family where they've learned that fear from. Mm. So if a child's going to have a fear of a mask, they're going to learn that fear from the family. So if the family is positive about it and making a good spin on it and is introducing them to the masks in a positive way, the kids are going to see the mask as a positive. And they're going to be, oh, get me mask, oh, get me mask. And if you look at shops and online, there's masks with Spider-Man, Batman, you know, comics on them that make them more friendly. We have to look at the masks now more as an item of clothing rather than a mask. If the kids don't go out without their runners on, so you don't go out without your mask on. Okay, stay there for one second. Let's have a listen to some more WhatsApp voice notes. This is Sanya. Morning, guys. I just don't think that the kids should be wearing masks going back to school. They're out playing with their friends for more than six hours, maybe a day. So, and they'd be touching their face more so than ever. Bye. All right, and Jeanette thinks the kids really do adapt. Here we go again. Yet another bloody conspiracy theorist. Another unqualified know-it-all. Just wear a mask. Kids can adapt better than we we do. And actually, I found that kids are doing their daily do's or whatever they do. They're going about their business like like nothing's happening anyway. So, I mean, kids, I don't see kids being affected by this at all, actually. I actually see a lot of happy kids around me. The people I don't see happy are adults complaining about everything. Um, I think kids can adapt better than we can. Because we're already set in our ways, basically. But they, they can adapt to change pretty good and pretty quickly. All right. Now, let me go to Spain. And, uh, Andy, you're living over in Spain. And your point is that if you can wear them in the heat, then you can wear them here in Ireland. Yeah. Hi, Adrian. How's everyone good, doing? Good, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I listen to your show out over here uh, every morning. And, you know, I've listened to people complain and saying, like, oh, you know, after 10 minutes, the mask annoys me and whatever. I'm, I, I live in, um, I live just south of Alicante, a place called Yoro de la Costa, and uh, it's, it's 40 degrees over here every day. And uh, me and my, me and my uh, girlfriend, we, we run a bar over here, and we could be in the bar nine, ten hours a day, you know, 40 degrees, mopping, sweeping, could be in the kitchen, you know, and you, you just get on with it because what's the alternative? We're all back to March and April, stuck in our houses, not being able to, to get out. So, and what are the yeah. rules in Spain for, uh, for school kids? Um, they have, to, they have to, to. I'm I'm not 100 percent sure on the when they're in the in the classroom because um, I don't have any children myself and they're only just back to school this week. So I haven't really spoken to any um, uh, parent friends of mine yet. But uh, I saw them coming out of a the school there one day uh, well, it was yesterday and uh, they were all wearing their face masks because the law over here is you have to wear your face mask at all times. Okay, at uh, all, uh, but you don't. You're not sure if that applies to school. In the classroom, no, I'm not, I'm not sure, no. Okay. And what is your opinion, then, on young children being asked, and we're talking, like, 6 to 11-year-olds, being asked mm. to wear a face mask for, like, 6 or 7 hours a day? Yeah, like, God, you know, you feel for them, like, you know what I mean? The kids at the end of the day, like, they shouldn't have to be wor- worrying about this kind of kind of stuff, you know what I mean? But, unfortunately, it's the times that we're in. Um, how do I feel about it? I wouldn't, you know, I personally wouldn't like to know, like, my nephew's gone back to school today in Tipperary. I don't want to know that he's wearing a, I don't want him wearing a face mask. But if if it's what they have to do and if it's scientifically proven that um, it helps to wear it, it protects everyone around you, then, you know, I mean, maybe maybe we all just need to, 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 to do it, you know? Mm. All right, so you you don't see the big deal here, basically. It's not that I don't see the big deal, but, it, you know, some people just kind of blow it out of proportion a little bit, like, you know what I mean? It's, it's you know... All right, we'll stay there for a second. Um, Robbie, you think, regardless of what rules may be brought in with regards to young kids wearing face masks, they're not going to keep them on all day anyway, are they? 
No, I don't think so, Adrian. Like, I do think it's a good idea if it's going to stop another lockdown to get them to wear it, but let's strip it back to basics, Adrian. Forget about your tinfoil hats and your conspiracy theorists and whatever. You're asking kids, and a large number of these don't even know how to tie the lace at the moment, to keep a mask on their face for six to seven hours a day. Mm. And then you're asking teachers, okay? Now, skills, kids have missed three and a half months of school. So the teachers are going to have to be catching them up on that walk and then moving on to the next year's walk. And then when they're out in the yard trying to keep them in groups of six or whatever it is. And then you're asking teachers on top of that, oh, teach me uh, my children how to wear a mask there, okay? Like, one, you're putting too much pressure on the teachers. And two, you're putting way too much pressure on a kid. Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, oh, but, Rob, here's, here's the question, and this is what Stephen Donnelly said mm. yesterday, and we can see the case numbers rising, particularly here in Dublin. Uh, we oh. see other countries oh. like France terrified of another national lockdown. Even Stephen Donnelly mentioning the word yesterday has everybody on edge now. Surely kids wearing a face mask as a way of stopping the spread of this virus is better than another national lockdown, which is now being... Uh, thrown around as a possibility. Right, I do agree, yeah, that's m- and that's my point on it. But between myself and yourself, I'd rather take the voice of a chicken than Stephen Donnelly. So I wouldn't be listening to him for starters. But I do agree that, yeah, getting the kids to wear the masks is better than going into another lockdown agent. But you're asking kids who can't even tie their lace to keep something on their face for six to seven hours a day. Mm. It ain't going to be easy. It ain't going to be easy. If, if anyone out there has young but ta- children, taking them out, uh, but uh, but Robbie taking them out of school altogether because we have another national lockdown is going to be even more difficult. Yes, yeah, I, I agree. Look, it's six and one half a dozen, Julie. You're going to have people say no masks. People say get the masks on them. What about just decreasing the class numbers? Do you know what I mean? There has to be other ways of controlling like the spread of the virus and guilt than saying look, just throw masks on them all. Do you know what I mean? If you want to be a conspiracy theorist, people don't believe that the masks work, Adrian. So what if you have the majority of the kids in the school that the parents don't believe the masks work? And they're just not going to put them on them. All it's going to do is cause trouble. So there has to be more ways of dealing with this than just saying, put a mask on a, on a child. There has to be. Just yeah, be I know. It's, it, it, it is very um, concerning. I, I do understand all of that. But I think what is even more concerning is the prospect or the thought with dark winter nights and freezing cold weather of having another nas- national lockdown where you can't go outside your own front door. Well, Adrian, I'll give you a good one. What about the times that are going into school and exiting school at? Like my partner dropped the kids to school this morning for the first time. One of my kids entered the school at 20 to 9, the other entered at 9, and the other entered at half 9. And she got on the phone to me, and the first thing she said to me was there was more people hanging around outside the school waiting to put their kids into school than she'd ever seen before. So that's a problem in itself as well. And that's a guideline that Nefri or Steve Donnelly or whoever has given us staggered times coming in and out. But it's working out worse. She said there was... Yeah, no, yeah. The the theory behind it is all well and good until you have three children and you're standing outside the school for 40 minutes. Yeah, no, I get that. And you're surrounded by another 40 parents. Do you know what I mean? So what about the spread that that's going to cause? All right, well, as I said, this isn't a uh, government recommendation yet. The Irish National Teachers Organisation is asking for clarity on it. Um, So, I mean, somebody texted in, uh, where have you seen the government wear their masks for longer than five hours and we're asking young kids to wear them? We're not yet. Uh, It is being discussed and a recommendation uh, hopefully will come through over the next uh, couple of days. All of you, thank you for your calls. This is Pam. I think it's absolutely disgraceful to ask um, kids to wear face masks in school. What about the kids that wear glasses full time? Their mask would steam up on them all day. I just, I just don't think it's fair. All right, and finally, uh, Jimmy. Hi, Adrian. I don't see what the problem is about wearing masks. Um, you pass any of these shops, and you'll see twelve to sixteen year olds standing outside with balaclavas half halfway up their face. They don't have any problems with that, but their mammies are worried about them wearing a mask. Come on. 
Uh, Jimmy, it, Jimmy, you're talking about teenagers. That's not what this conversation has been about. This conversation has been about primary school kids. Kids aged 6 to 11. They're not the ones hanging around outside the shops. So, all right. Thank you very much indeed for all of your uh, calls. We're going to keep an eye on that one over the next uh, couple of days to see if anything comes back from Neffet as to, because the INTO are seeking clarity on it uh, about whether or not kids should have to wear ma- masks. We know yesterday we spoke to a number of parents who uh, are sending the kids to school with a little pack uh, to include a face mask should the guidance change, and it may well change over the next uh, week or two. We'll uh, keep a close eye on it. You're listening to 98FM's Dublin Talks. This is Adrian Kennedy. We're here until uh, midday today. Have you or your partner had a baby in a strange place? (laughs) Because after the break, I'm going to be speaking to a woman called Laura who recently gave birth to a little baby girl at the side of the road while she was on her way to the hospital. I'll also be speaking to uh, her fiancé, Richard, who uh, delivered the baby. Um, As I said, I'll be talking to them after the break. But before we go to them, I want to hear from you about your own birth stories, either your close calls or your too late stories, like we're going to hear from uh, Laura and Richard. Where were you when your waters broke, for example? I know somebody was standing in the middle of an aisle in Dunn Stores when her waters broke. Did you give birth before you made it to hospital or did you make it just in time? Uh, We all know that babies have their own plans when it comes to making their grand entrance into the world. So I would love to hear your stories. I'm going to be talking to uh, this particular mammy and daddy whose baby came into the world at the side of the M3 motorway. We'll hear that story straight after the break. The sound of the city from Fur House to Finglas. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. Our telephone number is 67979081. You can also send me a text, a WhatsApp or a WhatsApp voice note to 0877989898. 0877989898. I want to hear your stories of that time you gave birth in a place that perhaps you weren't expecting to or that your waters broke in a place you weren't expecting to <laughs> uh, and call me on 67979081 because I'm about to talk to a mammy and daddy who uh, found themselves caught short basically um, and it's a, it's a great story I have to say um, I'm joined on the line uh, by uh, Richard firstly I'm going to be speaking to his partner Laura in a couple of minutes about what happened. Um, Richard, firstly, good morning and welcome to 98FM. Thanks, Adrian. So, take me to uh, the start of, of this story uh, when Laura kind of had the feeling that baby was coming along. Well, Laura had the feeling the baby was coming along in the afternoon, evening of Wednesday the 5th and um, we went to Drogheda, our lady of Lourdes and Drogheda and the midwife decided that Laura wasn't yet in labour and was advised to go home at the earliest. It would be the following morning when the baby would arrive. And um, we got home and around midnight, Laura tried to lie down and, and couldn't, felt she couldn't lie in the bed. So we decided to get back into the car and uh, headed for Drada. Um, we took the motorway towards Navin and um, Laura called the hospital to say that she felt the baby was going to come in the car and they advised us that the safest thing to do was just continue our journey. So we got to Navin North exit on the M3 motorway and Laura told me we had to stop the car. So I pulled over to the side of the road, put on the hazard lights. Um, when I opened the passenger door, I was um, I had Laura get undressed and, and recline the passenger seat so that she'd be a little more comfortable. And then within moments, the baby's head was visible and then a few seconds later... Laura gave a big push and the baby was born. My God almighty, yeah. that was quick. It was very quick, yeah. So she yeah. was she was barely in labour any any length of time? Yeah, well maybe, you know, maybe less than six hours. I don't know really, but I'm no doctor, so... <laughs> okay, and that's exactly yeah. it. You're no doctor and uh, there you are at the side of the M3 motorway um, delivering your own child. My God almighty. It's, it, it, it was, I remember when my kids were born, it was difficult enough looking at it, let alone actually <laughs> assisting in it. How did you cope? You have to. You've no choice. Yeah, we're just very lucky that everything went okay. Yeah. 
and in terms of like um, the umbilical cord and all that sort of stuff, did you have to do all of that? Uh, we were on the phone to a, a, a member of the ambulance services, and he stayed on the phone until the ambulance arrived. So he talked me through um, throwing off the cord with a shoelace. Okay, which you did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, very good. And, uh, the baby was awake and her eyes were open and looking around, so it was that was um, a relief to say the least. So the baby was breathing okay, um, yeah, and yeah. that's unbelievable. And the little baby is uh, Aoife, and uh, how is she? She's great. She gives out a lot when she wants to be fed or when she's dirty, you know, the dirty nappy. But other than that, she's fantastic. That is brilliant. That really, yeah. really is. So, yeah. um, in terms of, uh, you know, would you would you love to be uh, a midwife or a mid husband? <laughs> I don't think so. No, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a double job, but not one I think I'm, I'm made for. <laughs> All right, but uh, <laughs> but you, you you stood up to the plate and uh, you helped uh, Laura to deliver baby Eva at the side of the motorway. That's, that's correct. Yeah, great story to tell her in in years to come. No, it's fantastic. It really yeah, is. It really is, yeah. Well, Richard, fair play to you. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and um, you've set the bar very high for any other man who might be expecting a baby soon, so... Well, I think they're all capable of you don't realise it, you have to do it. Well, fair play to you. Great to talk to you, Richard. Thanks very much Thanks, indeed. Adrian. So, joining me on the other line here, I have uh, Laura. Uh, firstly, Laura, congratulations on the birth of your, your new baby. Thanks very much, Adrian. And we've just been hearing from Richard, who uh, did what not many men have to do, uh, delivering his own child. Is he a hero? He is a hero, yeah, (laughs) for sure. (laughs) He's definitely that. So he was explaining to us how you were, you decided, uh, no, this baby is definitely coming, even though you'd been sent home from the hospital. So at what point did you decide, oh, we have to pull in this car at the side of the M3 motorway? Um, literally, we rang the hospital at zero zero five seven at the just say the first exit of the M three, and by the time we got through the tolls, so we would have only passed one exit. I I I could literally feel her moving down, so I was like, "Oh my God, we're just going to have to pull in," because I think I could just literally feel like our head crowning basically, and we just had to literally come up off the exit. Now, we would have come up off that exit anyway because we were heading to Slane from Navin and then on to Drogheda. Um, yeah, so it was just like pull in right now because my seatbelt was still on and I knew I wouldn't be able to take her out with the seatbelt on or or um, obviously my pyjama bottoms were on as well so they had to come off. So it was just literally as soon as we could pull in safely into the hard shoulder, that's what we did and and it all happened literally all at the exact same time, Richie doing his bit, me doing my bit and within probably a minute of us stopping, she was out and on my chest, I reckon. My God almighty, that was quick. I know. That was yeah, quick. it really was quick, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and uh, baby Aoife is, is a miracle baby for you as well, isn't she? Yeah, rainbow baby, I think they're called. Now, I read that before, just somewhere online. If you had miscarriages or had a infant loss, uh, the next baby that kind of comes after that is, is known as a rainbow baby. And so, uh, she's um, fit yeah, and healthy. Yeah, miracle, definitely, yeah, after... We just said we'd give it one more try, or I wanted to give it one more try um, because of my age and stuff. Um, and uh, it, I, we had kind of taken a year out from it. My sister was getting married last year, and um, I just didn't want to go through any hardship again if it was going to go like that. So um took the year out in 2019. I was always aiming for an August baby, so the wedding was September. Uh, I waited till November to try and uh, yeah we just were here now I, I think sometimes things are just meant to be as well Absolutely and you, you already have a, a little boy Ryan uh, yeah, how, yeah. How, how was Ryan when he found out the baby came on the side of the motorway? Um, well I don't know if that part registered with him but he was <laughs> delighted that he had a, a baby sister because he wanted a girl all through the nine months and we had to try to explain to him now it could be a boy but he wasn't going to be happy if it was going to be a boy <laughs> and I was trying to convince him but to be able to play diggers and stuff with you um, stuff like that but um, yeah no he was absolutely delighted when it was a girl and, and now I'm sure he'd be delighted either way but uh, yeah no it was brilliant now So a gentleman's family as they say yeah, uh, a exactly, boy and a yeah. girl so when's the wedding going to happen? Uh, God knows, with coronavirus anyway, maybe uh, 
2022 maybe we'll aim for a day but we haven't really discussed it now Aoife is only three weeks old today so um, we're, uh, as I say to people I'm nearly still waiting for a labour that I never really had because <laughs> it happened so quick so nothing else is registering me or with me right now apart from just getting used to having her around and all the knifeys and sleepless nights and stuff like that <laughs> Well as I, said, as I said to Richard a minute ago he set the bar very high for uh, men assisting women in giving yeah. birth so um, it really is a challenge for blokes but it, it, look it's a, it, an amazing way uh, for little Eva to come into the world and a great yeah, as I said to Richie yeah. a, a great story to tell her in the years to come yeah it is for sure yeah all right, well, look, I wish uh, all of you the very best. Uh, and Laura, I really appreciate you talking to us and, and sharing your story with us. No problem, Adrian. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. And I'd like to hear from you on 67979811. You can text, you can WhatsApp, or you can send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877989898. I want to hear your stories of peculiar places that your uh, babies come into the world or maybe how you came into the world um, or where you, you, your water's broke in the strangest of places. Call me now on 67979881 or send me a WhatsApp voice note to 87 Seven ninety-eight, ninety-eight, ninety-eight. Violet, good morning. Good morning to you. Now, that story brought back memories to you. It did indeed. Uh, we had our 19-year-old girl now, Abby, in the Julian Stenning car park, which is now the lime kiln. Right. In, uh, <laughs> How, go on, tell me the story then. What happened? Well, I went into labour and we had two boys. They were like five and three at the time. So I got up and decided to have a bath, as you do when you're in labour. And um, about two hours later, decided, OK, we'll drop the kids down to my mum's. Um, got to my mum's house and I was like, OK, I think we need to leave. So we were in Balbriggan. We were only going to Drogheda. And um, by the time we got to Julianstown, I was like, my husband, Michael, I was like, Michael, if I say pull in, you need to pull in. So um, within minutes then, it was Michael, pull the car over. <laughs> pull in, you need to pull in now. So it was minus three degrees, end of January. The roads were just like pure ice, uh, rush hour traffic. So we're heading to Drogheda and all the Dublin traffic's heading in. Couldn't get into the car park. So we were like flashing hazards on, beeping, trying to get across into the car park. And it took a few minutes. So eventually someone let us cross over and he didn't even have time to take his seatbelt off. Right. Um, put a handbrake on, nothing, and out she popped. <laughs> Just like that? Just like that. So um, <laughs> it, it was really weird because like, she was born about 100 yards from where my dad was actually born. And... Um, I looked at the clock when she was born. It was 7.13. And then when we eventually got to the hospital, she weighed in at £7.13. ounces. Wow. So. And it's bizarre, actually, because we were talking with Laura a couple of minutes ago. They were heading to Drogheda as well, of all places. And mm. uh, the little baby came along. And uh, 90, I, I assume you... Uh, what you, you say your daughter's name was, Abby? Abby, yeah. Abby, I assume you've told Abby the story. Oh, yeah, she knows. We go back annually and, like, park in the spot where she was born and, you know, uh, have birthday lunches there, OK? Isn't that mad? Like that. Yeah. That so is amazing. Everyone was like, oh, call her Julia or Julia or something like that. I was like, no, that's too uh, nasty. Right, so after the place she was born in. Oh, it's a great oh. story, uh, Violet. Thanks very much, Lee, for sharing it with us. Uh, Keith had a bit of a, a dramatic experience with the birth of his child. Hi, Adrian. Um, just listen to that story. Wow. Um... Fair play um, to himself. The only thing is, um, well, it could have been to a similar uh, situation myself and my wife. We went in to labour and went up to draw the hospital. And my wife was in the labour ward, screaming in pain. And the midwife says, oh, it's too early. You don't need an epidural. And she comes back and she says, oh, it looks like a kidney infection. Two hours later, the baby was out. Some kidney infection that was. She didn't. She wasn't. She wasn't even able to get the epidural. She had to go all natural, gas and air. No, I don't think that's shocking. But um, baby's good and healthy and safe, and we're all delighted. But awful experience. Awful experience. I don't imagine what he felt like there now in the car. I've been sent away from the hospital and not thrown around, having to go back. Crazy. All right, Keith, thanks very much indeed. Rachel and Niall, I'll take your calls straight after the break. I'd love to hear from you with your stories of, of where your waters broke or where your baby was born that wasn't in a hospital labour ward. 
the sound of the city from Sagart to Sutton. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. We were speaking a couple of minutes ago with uh, Laura and uh, Richard about the birth of their baby at the side of the M3 motorway uh, just outside Navan. <laughs> uh, they didn't make it to the hospital and uh, the little baby came along. Uh, but it all's good that ends... Uh, all's... What's that expression? All's well that ends well. Sorry. Um, anyway, we're talking about your stories of weird and wonderful places you had your baby. Rachel, good morning. Hello, Rachel. Oh, Rachel's not there. Okay. Um, uh, Catherine. Hi. Now, Catherine, tell me where you yeah, were. Hi, Adrian. Tell me where you were when your waters broke. <laughs> my first baby, I had a pain in my stomach and I had to go to the toilet. Right. I went in and I was sitting on the toilet and I was just sitting there waiting to wee and next minute, five minutes had passed and I thought, hang on, what's going on here? And my waters had gone. <laughs> and obviously being your first baby, you didn't really know what was going on, did you? I didn't you? know. It was, I, I thought I was still weeing. <laughs> But so it wasn't. Just, but it wasn't. It wasn't. No, it was the water had gone, and I was sitting there not knowing what to do. At thirty, I was only thirty-seven weeks as well. Oh right. Okay. So what did you do then? Um, I called my husband in, and I said, "I think the water has gone. I don't know what to do." And he rang the hospital, and they told us to come in. But the baby, well, I wasn't in labour when I got into the hospital. But the baby was born six hours later. Oh right. Very good. Okay. So you you, you managed to make it. Yeah, I made it to the hospital on that one. Very good. Any other close calls? Uh, there's my second baby well, it was an unusual story I was in Hollow Street for him I had um, pelvic function disorder so I was in hospital today before I went into labour and I told the nurse I had pains at about 4 o'clock and she said you can't be in labour you're, you're too jolly but I'll examine you anyway she said you're not in labour you'll be about another two hours or so and you'll be in labour so I was like alright okay if you say so walked around for a while sat down all of a sudden got a darting pain in my stomach and the nurse said, you can't be in labour, I just examined you. I said, I'm having the baby, I can feel the baby's head crowning. Right. She was like, stop being a silly girl, is what she said to me. Really? In those uh, words? Yeah, those words, I can remember them to this day, he's nearly 15, and I remember to this day, stop being a silly girl, you're not in labour, I only examined you 20 minutes ago. So I put my finger on the buzzer, and I kept my finger on the buzzer until she came back to me. And I told her I was having the baby. She examined me and the baby's head was crowning. My God almighty. So she didn't know her job that well then, did she? No, not very well, no. <laughs> all right. Anyway, uh, uh, like, they, like I said, all's well that ends well, as they say. Um, and baby born safely. Yeah, he was born in the labour ward six minutes. He was born. <laughs> Brilliant. Great story. Thanks very much indeed, Catherine. Uh, Anto sent me uh, this message about his, his mam didn't quite make it to the labour ward. Hi, Adrian. Uh, I was born in the lift in the kiln 43 years ago. My mam was in scurries when she went in labour. Uh, uh, it would be fun sometimes when I go visit people in the kiln and I stand in the lift and I just think to myself, well, this is where it all began. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I can't come on. I'm flat out working. Okay, cheers. All right, no week. bother. Thanks very much indeed, Andrew. He's born in the lift. Uh, now, let me go to this line here, and that is Rachel. Rachel, good morning and welcome to 98 FM. Hey, Adrian, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Rachel. Rachel, tell me your story. Oh, God. Um, it was actually on my eldest son. Um, I was in Abercababra in the square. Uh, right. And my waters went. <laughs> and it, it was like something else was film, you know, like it wasn't like sometimes they go, it's like a trickle. This was like a gush. Oh my God, and, no. Yeah, and I was wearing all white. Oh so no. Was, <laughs> yeah, and it was like, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, I'm not being disgusted. There was a photo. There was an actual photo. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I was more, and do you know, to this day, the security guards remember me. Really? And... Yeah, so oh, the security God, guards in Abercababra at the square in Tala uh, remember you to this day because your waters broke. Yeah. And what were you having to eat yeah. as a matter of interest? I actually, I, I, was, I hadn't even ordered it yet. That's the, I had I walked in and I had actually walked towards the door because a friend of mine was following me. So I went to go out to the door and I literally just stopped and she came over to me and she said to me, are you okay? And I said, you know, I said, I might have, after peeing in myself, I said, or my waters are gone. And I looked down, and it was literally, it was, it was, All I never seen nothing like it. Yeah, it was, it was like a river. I expected something like this in films. 
<laughs> so uh, what what year was this, Rachel? That was 98. 1998. And they, and they remembered you remember for years it. after that? To this day, they still remember me. There's <laughs> two of them that were in the square and they're still walking there today and they still remember me. That's and hilarious. I yeah, I still avoid them. And even when I see them, I'd be mortified. Come here, um, so what happened from then? Were you rushed to hospital or...? Yeah, I was brought to hospital, but like, I didn't even have them then. I had them three days later. Oh! <laughs> Right. Yeah, it was uh, it was the weirdest thing. Like, but I have to say, it was just mortifying because it was packed. The whole shop fabric cadaver, it was packed. That's unbelievable. And was, yeah, and I'd never forget because I actually avoided walking past it because <laughs> of the hu- the humiliation of it. Yeah, it was just because I, every time when I actually had him and I walked past for the fourth time, I could actually see them looking at me, and I was like, "Oh my god, I'm never doing this again." <laughs> I used to cross over to the car park a different way to uh, get in the entrance at the other side. That's a brilliant story. <laughs> so I, I, if any of those lads are listening, they'll know exactly who we're talking about. Yeah, they could have given me a free burger. But, <laughs> but they didn't, yeah. <laughs> Great to talk to you, Rachel. Thanks very much indeed. Nice Thank you. Thanks and um, Maeve, tell me about your sister uh, last uh, Wednesday. Um, just Wednesday night, she gave birth to her son in her bed. Um, with myself, my mum and her fiancé and her daughter in the house. And the two ambulance men arrived just in time to deliver her son, Tylan. So, was it a case... That wasn't planned, obviously. Absolutely not, no. She had gone into the hospital at half seven the previous evening and they sent her home. And then her fiancé called us at 10 to 3 to say um, she needed to go. So we just arrived on time and knew there's no way she was going to make it to the hospital. So <laughs> So she had the baby in the bed? In her bed, yeah. Yes, yeah, she's an absolute superstar. Oh, that's we're brilliant. all so proud of her. So we uh, just uh, want to send big congratulations. What's your sister's name? It's Katrina King. Katrina King and the little baby is called Tylan. Very good. Well congratulations. and whereabouts are they from? Um, they live in Sagard. They live in Sagard. All right, Katrina. Yeah. Congratulations. Um and uh, you said the the paramedics arrived just in time. Just in time, yeah. I'd say there was just a matter of minutes to spare. Yeah. That's brilliant. <laughs> she did absolutely amazing. Oh, well, congratulations to them all. Uh, lovely story. Thanks very much indeed, Maeve. Thanks. And um, I got this message. Um, f- my son, Tyke, was born um, in 1999 on the 31st of October. Yes. Halloween night. Myself and the missus were in fancy dress when she went into labour. <laughs> And I was half full also. In other words, I'd had a few to drink, uh, says Des. So they were in fancy dress when she went into labour. I love your stories. Thank you very much indeed for uh, sharing them with us. This is 98 FM. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. IMRO award winning local current affairs show of the year. If you've been listening to this programme uh, right throughout the pandemic, right throughout lockdown period, uh, you will remember that a couple of months back uh, we spoke about uh, Bewley's on Grafton Street and how sadly it was closing down for good because of um, the effect of the lockdown, because of issues over rent. Uh, Unfortunately, 110 people were losing their jobs in the iconic building on uh, Grafton Street. Well, a couple of months later, and I love finishing off the show with a bit of good news, and the bit of good news today is that Bewley's reopened this morning, which is fantastic news. And I'm joined on uh, the line by Cole Campbell, who's the uh, Managing Director for uh, Bewley's, a family-owned business. And uh, Cole, good morning and welcome to 98FM. Good morning and thank you very much for having me on. Cole, I'm uh, delighted. Well, sorry. Firstly, I was very depressed and disappointed to report the news a couple of months back that uh, Bewley's on Grafton Street wasn't going to reopen. And I remember walking past the place during the lockdown period and thinking, oh my God, this is awful to see such an iconic brand, an iconic building. But it's turned around and um, you reopened this morning. How did that come about, Cole? Well, I suppose when, like, what you've just described there, uh, you know, the, that sort of sense of walking past and, and sort of, like, wondering how had everything come to this. Uh, certainly, that was where we were. And back in, in, in April, 
they also with terrible deaths and and the the you know, like the, the the amount of infections and the sort of the stream of bad news, not just um, the economic but the you know, personal stories mm. and the way that it was affecting people. And we looked at that and, and um, looked at the circumstances, looked down the road, and, and it, it, it was it was dark, it was bleak, um, and and that's why we took the, the took the decision. Um, Which must and, have been a very it, very difficult decision at the time to was, yeah. to tell all of I your was. staff that um, you know when businesses reopen, Bewley's wasn't going to be one of them. Yeah, and you may recall that the the the, the, the announcement was it was um, just on the uh, as the um, the government announced that cafes would be allowed to reopen. Mm. So you know, like it was kind of a, a, a double hit because the sort of perhaps you know a sort of little bit of expectation that we were coming back, and then we were announcing that that we weren't. Happily, however, they kind of. The, the, the circumstances since have, have changed and, and I guess as we saw the country pulling together as we saw the city you know, pulling together, as we saw communities getting together we, we, we looked at it and, 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 and in some sense never lost hope and kept looking for a solution and that's where we came to the, 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 the I suppose the realisation that for us, for Bewley's, which has had a, a ringside seat in so many turbulent events that going back to the, the 1800s, you know, mm. that, 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 that we, we've seen wars and, and other pandemics and everything, that we had to be part of the solution. We had to be part of the recovery. And that we wanted that recovery to be something other than a, just an economic recovery. And we wanted it to be a recovery that was, was about values and community and art and culture. And one of those uh, facilities in Dublin is that uh, iconic uh, cafe on Grafton Street. Uh, so you managed to sort out the issues that were there with rent and all of that, and that was all sorted. And today, finally, this morning, you reopened your doors, which is fantastic news. How have things gone for the opening morning? I, 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 it was it was a delight, and uh, we we simply opened the doors. We, we hadn't pre-announced it um, uh, on on the you know like for for anyone. And uh, this uh, lovely woman with her with her son, uh, with, you know, they were in town shopping, and they 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 they, they came in. They were the first people in through the door. Um, and then you know people from other businesses uh, around, like staff and you know Peter Master and Hickey, they they they, um, they all started to arrive in, and more and more people. And it's been it's been uh, fantastic. That's brilliant to hear. You know, and and obviously for uh, your staff who had thought that they were um, out of work, they obviously got good news as well. Oh yeah, and it's it's great. Like like everyone who's here is is, is part of the team that, that 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 was here before. And as we were uh, like we 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 started off with with, with five people, then ten people, then twenty people, and we we, we we're going to keep taking uh, people back on you know, as as things uh, build up. We started on a small scale with a small menu, you know, the coffee and cakes, the the, the cherry buns, the patisseries, the chocolate cakes. Um, and then as time goes on, then we'll, we'll grow to... Uh, and a, hopefully a take more and more staff back on as well, yeah, which is absolutely. fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. But it, it really goes down to, to, you know, that it stirs some moment of connection for Dubliners and that they would come back in. And it's on, 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 the, on the, the, you know, the things that it means to them and that they would come in and use the place. That will build us back up. And I think that that's something that everyone in the city centre hopes for in, in, as well. Absolutely. And I, I know from talking to listeners a couple of months back when uh, it was announced that you were closing, people were disappointed about having you know, uh, nowhere to go on Christmas Eve, for example. Uh, it's part of their Christmas tradition. And people were really uh, mourning the loss. And I'm delighted to be able to report the good news story today, Cole, uh, <laughs> that uh, albeit with limited capacity and so on for the time being, uh, but Bewley's on Grafton Street is reopened for business. Great to hear, uh, hear that uh, today, Cole. And I wish you uh, continued success. And I hope uh, things can get back to much more normality uh, in the in the foreseeable future. 
you. Great to talk to you. Thanks right. very much indeed. Thank you very much. That is Cole Bye Campbell, then. Managing Director of uh, Beauties, about the reopening of Beauties on Grafton Street today. Good uh, news story to end on. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We'll have more good news tomorrow, being Friday. Um, and if there's anything you want us to bring up on the show uh, tomorrow, send us an email right now to Dublin Talks at 98fm.com. Barry Dunn is next with some great music lined up in the next hour like these. Dublin's 98FM.